Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be interviewing a former child star of the 60s, Stefan Arngrim. You may remember him. He was on The Land of the Giants. And years later, he shed that wholesome image when he played the main killer villain in Fear No Evil and that timeless, timeless classic we all know, Class of 1984, with another past guest, Lisa Lingua. I'm having him on the show today to talk about all of that stuff. And also, I want to ask him about his music career. He had a music career with a band in the mid-'80s. They had a record contract that never came to full fruition, and I want to find out everything about it, and I can't wait. It's going to be pretty fucking sweet. So yeah, here is my interview with Stefan Arngrim. Hello. Hey, Stefan. Welcome to the show. Hey, how you doing? I'm great. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm all right. Nice. Can you hold on just a second? Sure thing. Hello. Yep. Yeah, hi. Yeah. <laughs> it's such an honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, not at all, Tommy. Thank you for your patience. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. So, going back to the beginning, I mean, you were obviously a child actor. At what age did um, you fall in love with acting and start doing it? Uh, gee, um, well, my parents were actors, and uh, I, I, I don't remember a specific time that I, like, fell in love with it or anything like that. I, I just, uh, <coughs> um, my parents moved uh, from Toronto to New York when I was like two years old and, and my dad was doing a play on Broadway and my mom was playing a lot of clubs and stuff because she was a singer and and, uh, and stuff like that and, and my parents for some reason didn't believe in babysitters so they just like took me everywhere so I went to the theater that night and then I went to the bitter end the next night and then I went to you know with my parents all over but so it was like a family business and I just uh and, and all my friends' parents were, were actors or dancers or mm-hmm. singers or <laughs> writers or something. Yeah. And uh, so it just, uh, I, I don't remember even thinking about it. I just sort of, you know, a friend of my folks was a big casting agent here in New York, and uh, he came to a party of theirs and asked if my parents had ever thought about me being in business. And I was like, uh, dance around on a coffee table at two in the morning entertaining their friends and, and they said, eh, well, we figured we'd let him decide. And then and this guy said, well, I think he's already decided. <laughs> and a few months later, I was doing uh, uh, Search for Laura, which was my first job, which I did for a year and a half here in New York. Oh, nice. And then um, you started doing a lot of guest appearances on shows like Gunsmoke, Dragnet, Combat, but... Your first movie was The Way West. Yeah, well, it, 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 it was, and it was, and it wasn't. I, 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 um, I was working in, here in New York City, and, and I was doing a lot of shows that were coming out here. And in those days, in the 60s, 50s and 60s, television and films were still very divided. You know, mm-hmm. the film industry still, still saw television as being a competition to some degree. So they really only shot so much television in L.A., you know, and then the rest was in New York. They even had different unions, you know. There was IATSE in California and NABET in New York, and, you know, not, not for uh, uh, talent, but for crews and stuff. Anyway, so uh, uh, I got, I got, uh, uh, I, I went out to Los Angeles to do a screen test for MGM and for uh, Screen Gems, and they sort of split the bill on it. I read for yeah. this to him, and, uh, and then when Noe Gussie, Noe Gussie was really famous, I didn't know this, I was only seven, but she was like a big deal, you know, casting 
woman that's green gems and you're in Hollywood and then Joyce Selznick who was David O's granddaughter mm -hmm. and uh, she was head of casting at MGM and everyone was terrified of these women right and everyone all the actors in, in Hollywood I didn't know who they were so I really didn't think anything I thought they were nice anyway so I got <laughs> <did> screen <laughs> testing it went off okay and everything and then I guess what they decided is uh, MGM won so I signed with MGM and I was going to do this movie called The Singing Run with uh, Debbie Reynolds mm -hmm. and uh, I'm playing Dominique who French Canadian wrote she writes song about and all that stuff so I was cast in New York and, and, and uh, filmed in and for various reasons it happened that time. it was delayed for about a year year and a half mm -hmm. and uh, when I got out to Los Angeles my band and I flew out there about a year later uh, got to the MGM Lot 3, shot about three days out there, you know, at supposedly like this Quebecois school for or orphanage. Mm -hmm. it's, it's orphan. Shot about three days, it just seems out there. And then the women arrived on like the third or fourth day, and, and Debbie Reynolds was there with a bunch of suits from you know, the main office. And, and, and I was taken out of the shot and brought over by an AD, and I, I met. Debbie Reynolds and, and we looked at each other straight in the eye <laughs> because uh, it was a year and a half had gone by and, and I was like seven years old and I had grown like some four inches or something. Mm -hmm. Debbie Reynolds is a really tiny little woman, like you know, barely five feet. Yeah. And, and I'm supposed to be this little orphan kid that she's supposed to carry around on a scooter. Well, you shouldn't have seen the blood drain out of all these secular faces, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and they were terrible. And then Debbie Reynolds, it was very sweet how she went. She just started laughing. She came in, came right over, gave me a big hug, and was laughing about it. And, and everybody else started nervously laughing about it. Within seconds, an AD was in the crowd casting some extra kid to replace me. <laughs> <laughs> and then they said, gee, we're really sorry. This isn't going to work out. We'll call you. And then they put us up at the shots on my mind for almost a year and then at the end of the year I, I got I had a pay or play contract on on, on uh, uh, singing them so I got paid whether I did it or not and uh, then at the end of the year they came back and they said uh, we got this other movie we, uh, called The Way West uh, and we broke it for the son and you know because that's how it was in those days and basically studios came to you and said we got this movie for you right and so I, so I did that Wow. So that, that's how it became the first person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's phenomenal. Uh, do you have any memories of working on the movie? Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. I actually do have, remember most of my career pretty vividly. Uh, yeah, I met, I, well, first of all, that was, that was kind of a, a special thing because that was one of the sort of last big blockbuster western Hollywood studio movies. I mean, and, mm -hmm. and it didn't do very well either. And, <laughs> and, uh, it had, because it was a little out of time, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but an incredible cast. I mean, you couldn't assemble that cast. You know, Kirk Douglas, Ralph Richard, Richard Woodmark, Lola Albright, the Sally Fields first movie, uh, all these character people like Jackie Rivers, and yeah. Cody Kelly, and people like that. You could, if, if you took, if you tried to find if you tried to match up a cast of current actors, you know, uh, mm -hmm. with those people and say, okay, well, this is sort of, you know, you'd never be able to afford, afford it. It would cost you like $180 million just to pay the cast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this movie was like seven and a half million dollars and MGM was freaking out about it because it was over budget in 64, right? Yeah. So, um, so it was, it was pretty interesting, but also longer. I mean, the movie shot, we were like seven months shooting that film. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly in a location and then some at MGM. You don't do that now. The last movie I did, or independent feature I did a couple of years back, shot in 13 and a half days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's boom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the independent films. And... Andrew McLaughlin directed, that guy was prolific. That guy would direct like a movie a year for years. Who was this? Uh, Andrew McLaughlin. Oh, yeah, Andy McLaughlin, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Especially a lot of war movies. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was a character. There was something. And then Harold Peck, you know, the writer was Ben Heck. So, I mean, it was real. That movie was a very, you know, uh, very Hollywood movie. I mean, everybody involved was in some way, you know, second, third generation, you know, big Hollywood and then big stars and everything. So that was a real interesting sort of uh, introduction to Hollywood <laughs> business. Because, uh, yeah, that is about the first thing that I did. Uh, you know, I, nice. And then came Land of the Giants. scared of uh, the creatures that were on the show? No, no, no. First of all, we didn't see any of the creatures on the show because they're really all visual and photo effect. Uh, uh, that was the thing about that show is that uh, we had people like, uh, you know, L.B. Abbott and Art Cookshank and guys like that, names like that, who, you know, uh, done, went on to do things like 2001 and Space Odyssey and the pioneers of visual effects and, and optical uh, the, uh, the traveling mats and mat shots and all that stuff and blue screen which now of course is called green screen <laughs> yeah but, uh, but it's very advantageous for me really because you know at like 11 years old I got used to working in front of nothing in front of a blue screen and reading lines up into a piece of tape up on the you know catwalk and and uh and so much filmmaking is done like that now. There's so much effect work and green screen and real serious make believe time. And I noticed that there's a lot of younger actors who they didn't get any training in that. You know, the real younger actors did, like in their 20s stuff. They know that stuff. But, you know, they don't know that stuff. Nobody told them about that. Nobody gave them any green screen classes in, in that year school. So it's, it's, it's tough. I, I haven't, you know, I'm, just, I'm just lucky. I have an advantage. I have no problem having long conversations with, you know, a light on me. Yeah. I got to meet Deanna Lund at probably her last Comic Con in 2016. And, um, oh God, she was such a delight. And 
Yeah, Gary Conway was there too, but um, he had a very yeah. long lunch, so I didn't get to meet him. And Don Marshall was scheduled to be there. He got sick, and then he passed away a few months later. But yeah. Deanna, yeah, she was such a delight, and I got to interview her daughter, Michelle, a few months ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Deanna was terrific. Yeah. You know, it's inevitable when, you know, you have actors work, you know, if you're working every day, you can really get across like any job. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think that I think the Giants uh, had, uh, was a real special that way. We really, we really did remain in touch uh, uh, for a while. I mean, I, you know, I was speaking to Vienna just before she died, and, and uh, I talked to Gary pretty frequently. And, you know, and we all we all kind of stay connected. And, uh, and, uh, and worked very hard. I mean, that was a, that was not an easy show to do. Yeah. So we didn't, we didn't, uh, we did most of those, uh, well, not so much stunts, but we did all that climbing and jumping and running and stuff because, you know, it's just somewhere between stunt work and acting, and, you know, it wasn't, <laughs> but we got pretty banged up and bruised on that show. And, uh, and, you know, it was a tough schedule and all that, but we also became very, very close. And, and it was a really lucky break because there just wasn't, there wasn't anybody in that cast that, that, that wasn't just terrific. It wasn't just really a fun person as well as, you know, people to work with. Mm-hmm. And what was Erwin Allen, Allen like? Erwin, you know, you know Erwin, Erwin, Erwin had, was driven. And he had, a, he had a real vision for all this stuff. And it worked. He had a real formula for it and everything like that. I I don't I think details and and, and certain things aggravated him. Anything we, <laughs> it was sort of like you know, in the way of his master plan would aggravate him. And he did get very aggravated very easily and and uh, he wasn't always the easiest person for actors to work with because he sort of felt like actors were just another special effect. Yeah. And you know, like, <laughs> just do this and say that and be over here and then you know and uh, and you know and and, and just to a great extent he's right you know but but uh, but you know you kind of have to split the difference you know and uh, you, know, it, it, you know I think like any any cast on any television series as an executive producer we had our moments and you know, everybody had some kind of run in at some point or another over something usually usually hair or the way wardrobe was fitting or something like that <laughs> it's really really weird little thing nothing very serious and uh, and of course when, when things were were going well and you couldn't have a better boss he was you know thrilled and and it certainly wasn't cheap Yeah. <laughs> Although it led the way for a lot of crap that came, you know, in the future, like what Jerry Bruckheimer and Michael Bay did. <laughs> well, yeah, but you know, that's that's always the way it is. I've had this theory for a long time that it's, you know, that <laughs> at any given time, no matter what, how much product you get available, it's going to break down into the, you know, the 10, 10, 80. Uh, in scenario, which is 10% of it is going to be cream and really wonderful. 10% of everything is going to be absolute dreck and unwatchable, unlistenable, just badly executed, not well done. Right. And then 80% of everything is going to be okay. Yeah. Not great, not, not, not terrible, but, you know, well done, and, yeah, 
And, and it doesn't seem to matter whether that number goes up or down, that 100%. It always seems to break down into a, a rough pattern of like 10% brilliant, 10% crap, and 80%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then, um, about ten years after the show ended, you um, shed your image by by playing a killer in Fear No Evil. Yeah, it's not just the killer, actually, Lucifer himself. Um, yeah. I kind of, I kind of shed that image. She landed the choice with some kind of shedding an image because before and even after, I mean, the characters I played when you know, were orphans and. And you know, kids living on the streets, and you know, you know, in squats, and you know, sometimes dangerous, and you know, troubled, and all that kind of stuff. Land Giants, I was probably the best adjusted for Lord for never. And and uh, so, really, when Giants was over, you know, two things, of course, happened. First of all, generally speaking, when at least in those days, when we had three networks, and that was it. Uh, you know, now you don't have to have 20 million people watch your show. You only really need maybe a million people. You got a hit. You know, mm -hmm. those days you had like 20, 30 million people to watch the show. So, um, uh, yeah, it, it, uh, after the show for a couple of years, you generally it's going to be hard to work because casting people and producers and stuff are going to be thinking of you as that person from that series. And I was. I went into a few auditions after right after Giants. I knew this was happening because my parents told me it was going to. <laughs> but I went in and and you know I made them look embarrassed and say, "Oh gee, uh, we thought you were uh, yeah little person." And of course I wasn't. I was 13, 14, and I, you know I was already like six foot tall. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, um, <laughs> So I didn't work for a couple of years, but that didn't stop me. I, I, I traveled. Uh, I you know, uh, saw much of the world. Uh, I, I started playing more music, which I always liked doing and I always played. I was in a bunch of bands and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, wrote a bunch of songs and uh, did that kind of stuff. And then, you know, and, and, I probably could have, if I wanted to stay based out of Los Angeles, you know, like really in my teen years, really pushed through and, you know, done more work. But I wasn't so much interested. I wanted, I figured this was my little time off here. And, and so I was going to go, you know, travel and meet people and see the world and play music and learn about music and literature and stuff like that. So I did. And I came back to Los Angeles and. And fortunately, I was able to start working again. I did several films, and then uh, I think Fear No Evil yeah, was like the second or third. And uh, yeah, yeah. And that was, yeah, it was fun. <laughs> yeah, I watched it not too long ago, and I just couldn't believe how wicked and brutal it is. I mean, you remind me of um, John Amplis and George Romero's Martin, just so. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah just so silent and creepy. <laughs>
I think it's one of the first films I ever worked on where uh, Freddie Goodrich had the room filled in fog in, you know, uh, dry ice, mineral water fog, mm -hmm. and, you know, thin it out so it diffused the light. And then he put a little black stocking over, <laughs> he rubber banded it over the lens. So it made all the, the colors very monochromatic. The reds are real red, blacks are black, white, white, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, everything's very hot, sharp, sharp edges. And then there's diffused light, which gives this weird three dimensional effect. So the whole movie has this very dreamy, weird quality about it. Like, is this really going on or what? Anyway, so yeah, it was fun. It was, it was interesting. Did you think that was going to be your big breakout role as an adult? No, I really don't think like that. Uh, because you know, because there's too many people involved in in doing things like making movies and TV shows. You can't you can't possibly say, oh, oh, gee, this is all about me. No, it's not. It's all about you know hundreds of people just in the actual crafting of the film. Everybody from you know, wardrobe and makeup to, you know, let's face it, the, the actors and, 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 and all those people, <laughs> we participate in the least amount of time in filmmaking, the shooting of the film, which is now down to like a couple of weeks. Post-production for the film is always, it follows the, the three-time rule. It's three times production generally and sometimes more. And post-production is where the film gets made. That's where it gets edited. That's where it, you know, sound is done, that's, you know, that's where all the dynamics of the film are put together. And those little scraps of performances and lines and dialogue and stuff like that get, get very artfully put together, collaged, montaged into the final movie. And you have no idea what that's going to be. You mm -hmm. know, um, I've, I've had this conversation with people on movies who've said things to me like, I think this is going to die, I don't know, this one just feels like a winner to me, you know, and, and mm. I think, uh, yeah, okay, <laughs> we'll see, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you just never know, uh, it's my fun doing some real cooking thing, huh? Mm-hmm, now yeah, cook, yeah. mm-hmm. Now comes that timeless cult classic, class of 1984. Oh, yeah. I've, uh, yeah. I've talked with Lisa Lingua about the movie, and she told me everyone was treated like shit on this movie, especially <laughs> especially the extras, she said. Uh, but who exactly was the real culprit behind the scenes? Oh, I'm not sure you could really lay it at one person's feet. Um, there were a lot of... There were a lot of problems with the, with the film. Um, I think, you know, it's interesting because it's, um, I think predominantly the, the, the... I'm a Canadian. I was born in Canada. And, mm -hmm. and I'm, you know, as an alien in the United States, so I was born in Ireland. But I think a lot of the Canadian actors, the local hires for that movie, were treated very badly um, by a lot of people in, in production. And, and, and that, that used to be fairly common. I remember this in 1981, um, or 8081. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I wasn't, I, I was hired out of LA. They flew me in from LA. I was on a SAG contract. And it's really quite amazing. I mean, I'm a Canadian, mm -hmm. but I have a, but I'm, I'm a Screen Actors Guild member, and I'm cast in LA, and I'm flying to Canada, I'm working with cast of, you know, actors, that I am being treated differently than the other actors who are local liars. Yeah. And, 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 and to the point where uh, Lisa and I were talking just a couple of years ago, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and she was recounting to me some of the stuff. You know, I knew a lot of stuff that had gone on during the movie, but she recounted to me her feelings about it and what had happened to her and everything. Mm -hmm. And she said, she said, she said, I know you probably don't know any much of this because you didn't take any shit off of anybody. <laughs> 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 I laughed and I thought, really? I didn't know, okay. You know, mm -hmm. so, no, I actually didn't notice all that much. All I did notice was a couple of incidents where, which I thought were, were unfair and I thought were sort of taking advantage of a, 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 a kind of a, a power uh, thing that, Authority 
that didn't really exist. I mean, you know. But I've run into that before on, on, on movies that are shot in Canada and in Europe and stuff. You know, oftentimes we'll find and it's misguided. It's not meant to hurt people, but it's misguided. They'll separate the cast by nationality. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and, and they don't, you know, and, and there are rules. Oh, don't go bother the Americans, you know, and things like that. Yeah, and it's always funny for me because I'm one of the Americans, but then again, I'm not. So, um, you know, I'm not, you know, not supposed to bother myself. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, um, it was a difficult film to answer the question. Uh, I think, I don't think anybody, people who had bad experiences with that movie, Class 84, uh, uh, are going to tend to hold Mark Lester responsible because he, he was the producer and director. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, now... Uh, like I say, I didn't have that experience. I'm sympathetic to it, but um, I did another film from Mark 17 years later called Miss We Got Kevin Bill and Nick Van Cusa. Mm-hmm. I never had any problem working with them, but then I kind of, I, I kind of knew who he was and how he worked and all that. So yeah, you know, but I think a lot of people. Have, yeah, I, yeah, a lot of people were treated unfairly, and I, I really don't know exactly who or, or why. I think, of course, if you're the boss, if it's your movie, then you're responsible for everything that happens. Yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've interviewed a lot of people who worked with Mark Lester, and he's not every way's cup of tea. Somebody's, uh, some people like him, some people don't, and stuff. But yeah, I mean, she told me that you know the the extras were given to eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and that was it and there was a lot of lots of other stuff and i was just like wow i mean it's just like it's no wonder like the violence comes off as realistic on the screen you know <laughs> yeah well there, there there certainly was uh there was some catharsis in that for sure um but uh yeah, yeah, there, there, there were some, there were some ugly words, and I, I think the, the one that, that disturbed me the most was uh, when uh, Neil Clifford, who was a wonderful, wonderful actor, as well as being a marvelous dancer and an artist and sculptor and stuff, and that's when he fought pretty much, you know, uh, he quit, he quit being an actor after class of 84. Mm-hmm. And we had an incident one night where we were shooting some essentially a, sh- a drive-by shot down Young Street in Toronto, which could have been could have yeah. been anybody, really. You could have put anybody in, in the wardrobe and put us in the car and driven us down the street. Yeah. And uh, 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 Neil's uh, wife was uh, was uh, pregnant, uh, in, and, at, and he'd gotten a call that she'd gone to the hospital, and she was in labor. And... Uh, wasn't allowed to leave the set to go be with his wife and mm-hmm. kid was born. Wow. And I thought that was a little extreme seeing as how it wasn't exactly a scene that was dependent upon him and frankly any of us. There were five of us in the scene. He could have he could have dressed up anybody as us and driven the spy in this car and it wouldn't have made any difference. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there was things like that. I, I'm not sure that that's, you know, malevolence or evil or anything like that. I just think that's, you know, bad filmmaking and bad planning and and, and not not understanding how this process works. There's no shot. There's no movie. There's no, there's no art period that, you know, that, that, that outweighs, you know, an important life experience, a real life experience, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Were you trying so with this and Fear No Evil? I mean, were you trying to get far as, as far away as possible from Land of the Giants and that image? Yeah, not really. I didn't. Again, I don't really think about it so much that way. You know, I, I don't. I I know when I was very young, there were my agent and my dad, who was my manager at the time. I know they probably turned down some things for me, but me as as uh, as an adult from from adolescence on to now, I don't actually remember turning down any jobs. Uh, I, I mean, I think I think a couple of people did any of stuff that really wasn't real. That, you know, they wanted, you know, but then there was no movie, there was no money or anything like that. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, that's different. But like, in terms of, you know, people who have a show, I, mean, I don't really care all that much. I, I enjoy working and, you know, it's kind of my day job. It's built. And, and <laughs> I'm not so much concerned about, you know, the overall film or, or show because that's not our responsibility as an actor on a hired gun. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I'm also a writer, and I, I, I've written a couple of screenplays, and I'm writing some stuff now. That's a little different. Uh, and certainly, if I wanted to direct, that would be different. But you know, as an actor, you you, you know, you got one thing to do, you do it, and that's it. And so um, you know, yeah. And consequently, of course, I you know, I've been on a lot of crap, but <laughs> <laughs> but I don't much care. I actually, I I. I uh, uh, I always, I'm always pleased with what I wound up doing, and I, I always sort of feel like, well, fine, I really, you know, don't give up. I really don't care about your crappy little movie. I'm just going to do this really like, interesting <laughs> little thing here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I discovered Class of 1984 because of the Alice Cooper song, because I had the album Zipper Catches Skin, and I always liked that song, I'm the Future. Yeah. I mean, Lala Schriffer and Mission Impossible, you know? I mean, with that guy, the theme, you know, composer for countless films and television shows, and he writes yeah. in the future with Alice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Alice has collaborated with a lot of people you would never imagine, like... Oh, no, I, yeah, no, I know. No, I've been lucky that way, too, is, is that um, most of those films, like in the uh, uh, late 70s, early 80s, all had really great soundtracks. And I like to think that I had some influence on that because I always, because I did, because I would say, you know, mm-hmm. I can hear no evil, Frank and I talked a lot about the soundtrack and everything and, and using, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, current music or music from, you know, like the Sex Pistols and so forth. And, uh, and same thing with Class of 84s. And, and actually the gang really, Keith and Lisa and Tim and I, we kind of scouted out bands in Toronto and clubs and things like that and, and uh, you know, brought that in to the movie. Yeah. <laughs> and that was fine with Mark because he didn't know any of that stuff and he figured, oh, okay, <laughs> my actors are going to do that good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then you, you took another long break and then you came back with Strange Days. Jim, Kevin, and Kathy. 
video, I want to see you, like, right now. You know, mm-hmm. I'm leaving town. And she said, you got to go. I said, okay. So I went downtown, and I, I met uh, Cameron and Catherine Bigwell, very nice, mm-hmm. wonderful people. And, and uh, uh, I bet I left town. I went to Vancouver. I told them. <laughs> So then I was up there and I got uh, got a call and they sent me a script and you know, and the original script was amazing. I uh, it was by by Cameron and Jay Cox, um, both you know both great writers, and uh, I was really really stunned by by the script. Um, un- unfortunately, and again this is like I said, you know this is what happens. Catherine Big was a terrific director, no doubt about that. But on the day when we got there. Just certain things didn't work. Mm-hmm. And other things did. And so the character Skinner that I played actually is in a lot more than that movie. <laughs> 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 it was sort of a whole, so there, was a, there was a couple of subplots yeah. to, to Strange Days that when they assembled it all together, it just got confusing. <laughs> <laughs> so they just kind of went, okay, <laughs> we'll cut this. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we had scenes down there. We were doing gunfire at night and stuff like that. And then we cut the scene, and everyone stopped firing. Mm-hmm. You still hear gunfire in the distance wow. because it was real. <laughs> we, were, we were we were on gang turf in downtown LA, firing off guns. Mm-hmm. God, <laughs> that's funny. And then, you know, just because they, they were armed. <laughs> <laughs> so you'd rather have them on your side. <laughs> yeah. That's taking the risk. Was, uh, yeah, and then we had, uh, like, what, for three nights at the end, we had 10,000 dress extras at the Bonaventure Hotel, and then for another four nights, I think 5,000, and it was just insane. Mm-hmm. That, was, that was crazy. It's been a lot of fun to do. Oh, good, yeah. Cath- Catherine Bigelow is from my hometown of San Mateo, California, I found out. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But she's from Palo Alto, though. Yeah, but, yeah. She's great. I like working with her. Mm-hmm. And she's an Academy Award winner now. She sure is. And it, so, the, so um, in addition to acting, yeah, you had a band called the Knights of the Living Dead, right? Yeah, I was reading that um, uh, you guys had a contract with Capital that fell through. <laughs> we had a contract with like about five labels that fell through. <laughs> with the Capital deal, with, uh, it was just simply a logistical thing. The president of the company, uh, of Capital Records, who when we were brought in, got fired by the board of directors and a new, a new president was hired. And when that happens in this business, or in any business, really, um, the new president doesn't want to screw around with the old president's garbage. Mm-hmm. And so, <laughs> it's like, I didn't sign that. <laughs> That's that other guy who got fired. He signed that. I don't want that. So, so uh, um, but it, 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 it was funny. It was good. It, it was a real, it was a, it was a really good experience. I mean, essentially, my partner, uh, my songwriting partner, a guy named Roland DeVoyle, just one of the most brilliant musicians I've ever worked with, we had this idea about the 
this music and this band. And actually, it was funny because it, it was sort of stimulated by the idea of, of uh, Anne Rice's uh, 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 interview with the vampire, the first one, and particularly the second one, Vampire Was That, because I'd always, I'd, I'd read that book, and I thought, what does this band sound like? What does this vampire band sound like? You know, because you can't hear it in the book, you know. And mm-hmm. Of course, there was a movie done, but you know, I didn't pay much attention to that. So I became obsessed with that idea. Roland and I started talking about it. And so we decided we would write what we thought the you know, band would kind of sound like. And then it morphed from there, and it became less about that. It just became, it just became this weird, like, sort of, you know, yeah. Monkey vampire love songs. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. What, and I've been making records since I was, you know, I mean, there's the thing, you know, like I said, when I did the TV series, if you're on television every week and you could fog a mirror, you could make a record in the 1960s. I mean, it, that was just the deal. So, you know, if you were in Tiger Bee magazine in 16 or Shave, I was in all of those. Record companies were banging on the door. Hey, and they didn't care. They didn't care if you could sing. They didn't care if you could they didn't just make a record, sell it to this audience and teenagers. And, and that was fine with me because I wanted to. I did play music. I, I, I played piano. I played guitar. And I'd already written some songs. And <laughs> I wanted to do it. And so I was 12 years old. And my dad and I talked about it. And I said, well, uh, they can exploit me if I can exploit them. So, so the deal is I'll do one of their sides for one of my sides, and I'll go do this, but I get to go work in like some of the greatest recording studios in the world and some of the greatest set. I mean, I have a wrecking crew of people on records that I did when I was like 12, 13 years old. Wow. Amazing musicians. Jimmy Keltner on drum. Don Peak. <laughs> and Wally Hyder's studios and Sunset Sound and all these, you know, the places. And, you know, uh, so so I got the best part of that deal. You know, I mean, frankly, I, I don't think I made any standout recordings at the time, but but I certainly did learn what I was, <laughs> what I was doing and how to do it. Yeah. And met a lot of good people. So that's been constant. With me. I've got some new material here at the moment. Oh, did you ever work with Don Peak? With who? Don Peak. He was a guitarist for the Wrecking Crew. Oh yeah, no, no, not to, not not. You know, when you deal with those guys, mm-hmm. you want, and particularly if you're, you know, it's your session, and you know, you're the, the singer or whatever the artist, and you, you know, if you even go to a tracking date, you're lucky. You know, I mean, I would get invited by the producers, you know, come to the tracking day. And I go to the tracking day. And there are these people, they're there. There's the wrecking crew. They're in the room. Mm-hmm. They're going to hang out with them, really. Because they're not going to be there long enough. Because <laughs> they're going to read the charts. They're going to play through it a couple of times. Bing, bang, boom. Maybe one, two takes. And they're gone. You know, and they'll meet you on the way out and say, uh, nice song. Hey, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, see you the kid. You know, so you don't get to really, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a very, very the way records used to be made. Yeah, to some degree, it was very, very uh, manufactured. It was a real assembly line. Yeah. Process. What 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 genres uh, did you play mostly? Oh uh, well, I I I've always uh, I I became interested in in. in Delta Blues and Chicago Blues and stuff like that when I was very young. Nice. And uh, and I just sort of uh, yeah. So that's sort of my 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 route is people like Robert Johnson and Sunhouse and Skip James and people like that. And then anyone who <laughs> plays that kind of music in the last you know uh, 50, 60 years. Uh, <laughs> but basically, I'm pretty you know. Yeah, I am too. I get that from my my dad. He's a big blues and rock guy. He's he played guitar. Yeah, yeah. He had a band when I was a kid, and he tried to teach me how to play guitar, but my fingers are so fat, I was never able to master it. Well, 
Well, you know, it's a funny thing. A guitar actually perplexed me for years. I had a terrible time. And then, uh, and then uh, in uh, 85, I was in a car accident, and uh, my radius and all that, my left wrist were shattered. And I can't subordinate my left wrist completely, which, in my mind, put an end to my guitar playing days. Wow. Uh, well, I can't subordinate, I can't turn my wrist completely, and I can't, you know, I can't use any chord forms or, you know, intonations. And then, uh, through mutual friends in 1992, I was lucky enough to be a clap when I was in London, and mm -hmm. it turned out these friends I was with were friends of Eric's, and I didn't know that, and, and we became friends, and, uh, and he was a terrific guy, but one of the first questions he asked me was about playing, and I told him my tale of woe, and I said, yeah, well, see, I broke my wrist, and I did that, 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 and he just sort of looked at me, and he says, hmm, well, you know, Django Reinhardt? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He goes, well, Django Reinhardt had, like, two fingers on his uh, right hand and three fingers on his left hand from a childhood accident when he fell into a campfire. And he played, so what's your excuse? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, I just got read out by Eric Clapton. So, uh, <laughs> so, and then I started, you know, he... he gently suggested open tunings and stuff like that. And so I, I started getting into that and playing a lot of slides. So that's, I predominantly play a lot of slide guitar and, and a lot of things in open tunings and stuff now. Wow. Yeah, but Jerry Garcia was missing half of his index finger. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah Jerry Garcia actually paid me one of, one of my favorite compliments. I wasn't even there for it, but I was doing this album with Moore and uh, g -Von called Transfer City. Mm -hmm. I'd written the words of the song Transfer City and, and the, the one of the themes of the album was we wanted to have a different guitar player on each track so Dave Gilmore played on one and Neil Young played on another and Jerry played on the other and like that so now when you work with Jerry you have to go there you have to go up to San Rafael mm -hmm. you know, well not you want but even when you did and you have to go to San Rafael to, to his studio and you take your masters up there <laughs> and, you know <laughs> so Warren and Doc, uh, uh, the engineer, uh, took the tracks up uh, of the song Transfer City to Warren and I and, and put it on, and, and Jerry played through it and just sort of a couple of times and was listening. And he stopped at one point and he said, Warren, did you, uh, did you write these words? And, and Warren says, uh, no, no, I didn't. Actually, uh, uh, a guy named Stephen Argon in Los Angeles wrote those words. And Jerry Garcia said, well, you tell Stephen Arnold for me that anybody who can use the word narcoleptic in a pop song is all right by me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, took, I took that as high praise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that, that, that sounds like high praise to me. So, what does the future hold for Stefan Arngrim? Like, do you have any upcoming projects? Yeah, sure do. I probably have more stuff on my plate right now than I've had in years. Um, uh, going all the way back to the way west, I, I uh, in doing that movie, um, oddly enough, I became I became friends with uh, Bob and John Mitchum and mm -hmm. the whole Mitchum clan, <laughs> essentially. And, and Bob and I were pretty good friends, and so was that '97. And um, and and Cindy Mitchum, who is John's daughter, John is Bob's brother. Mm -hmm. uh, called me a couple of years ago and said, "I'm trying to put together this thing now with all the music that Bob and John did, because they wrote a lot of songs, they played. John made an album in Nashville, all kinds of cool stuff." And um, so I started getting involved, and she wants me to record a recorded song for the CD, and I said, sure, you know, so uh, we got into that, and uh, I went out there and visited with her and her family and stuff, and, and then we got into the thing that her dad had written a book called, uh, 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 before he died, called uh, uh, The Honorary Mitchum Boys, The Adventures of Robert John Mitchum, and it's really quite extraordinary, I mean, it covers about 70 years, I mean, it's not just a Hollywood story, I mean, these two guys, you know, uh, rode the rails during the 
depression across the country, you know, initially, you know, a boat across on trains with people like Woody Guthrie and, you know, all these amazing characters and, and wound up, you know, and wound up in the sort of American El Dorado of, you know, Hollywood and, you know, and these careers and stuff. So we're, uh, we're developing that book you now into a six part uh, limited series for television. Uh, and uh, we had some interesting people involved in that. And then out of that came uh, 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 a company, a holding company called Mitchum Media, which I'm managing uh, with Cindy. And uh, we're doing a bunch of stuff. We've got a, my, old, my partner, uh, Barb, uh, uh, Barb Chisholm in Vancouver, who's the producer of one Cooper book. She and I are also in partnership with her company. So we have a whole slate of films and TV stuff that we want to do out of Mitchum Media. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start a little label and uh, release, uh, release some music. And, uh, not just my own, but you know, music of just that interests me uh, and stuff for Bob's and John's, but also stuff from new artists and you know, people like that. You know, anybody, anybody who's interested. Wow. That's amazing. So yeah, so I got a lot, <laughs> a lot going on right now. Actually, I'm, I'm in the process of uh, I'll be moving out to LA in the next month or so because that's where everything kind of is, and also I have to be able to get back and forth to Vancouver quickly because we have a production going up there. So yeah, it's a, it's a busy time. Yeah, that's great though. At least you know you got a lot on your plate. You know, so many people nowadays are just you know scraping by in the industry. Well, yeah, yeah. You just, uh, you just gotta, you know, you know, you just gotta keep working. You, know, you just gotta keep busy. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, and we got a lot of music stuff I'm working on too, and, uh, and I'm writing a lot of these projects that are gonna be on the slate, so that's fun. So, yeah, it, what the nice thing is, is that what, you know, I kind of see here that we created here is I kind of made like a little home for myself where I can pretty much, you know, it's like a you know, little playroom. I can go in there and kind of make anything. <laughs> you know, if I can get it done, you know, I can get it done, you know. Yeah. And the secret, of course, to that is, is you know, we live in a capitalist society and, you know, and the rules of the entertainment industry are governed by the same capitalist laws. And if you can convince somebody that this thing you want to do will make money, you can get it done. <laughs> if you can't, probably not. And, of course, you see how radically different L.A. has become now since it was, you know, back in the day when you were you know, working out there, you know, in classic Hollywood. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was, I was last in Los Angeles, I think, in 2012. And, um, you know, yeah, well, every place changes, but... You know, the funny thing about, uh, this is talking to a friend of mine, he a writer about this. And my dad always used to say that about, you know, uh, uh, business, just entertainment business, whatever it is, you know. It's a small town. It doesn't matter geographically whether it's in New York, L.A., London, you know, but it's still a small town. Mm-hmm. And people know people. We know <laughs> you're going to run into people after a while. And if you've been doing this for any period of time, and I've been doing this now since I was like five, so that's a while. And uh, <laughs> you get, you know, you just, you know, people just because it is. It's like living in a small town. You know, you work with the same people again and again, run into them here and there. And, yeah, you know, outsiders don't realize it's just like, you know, any, it's like, I mean, obviously, you know, it's a job where, you know, it's public and everybody knows you, but it's like any job, you know, you know, the same people, you know, you have to make relationships. It's just, it's just, it's just like any job. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Just yeah. People, people it, don't. Is, it is really just, it is his job. And, 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 and you have all the things, I mean, you know, and there's that, you know, uh, there's that thing I always thought was true about any room I walk into, about 30% of the people in the room are going to like me on site, and there's probably not anything I can do much about it, and 30% are going to dislike me on site, and there's not anything I can do about them, and the other 40% really aren't going to care one way or the other. <laughs> so <laughs> so that, that's kind of how I break down, the, you know, so... 
you do this stuff and, and uh, you know, you're going you're gonna to hit some people and, and, and not others. <laughs> and that's okay. Yep. Well, Stefan, I think... to do is just always, you know, it's like, I, you know, I don't have anything to do with the cards I'm dealt, but I have everything to do with the way that I play them. And the trick is just stay at the table. <laughs> in the game <laughs> and you know and you'll be fine you know you leave the table then you're not gonna lose you're not gonna win nothing's gonna happen yeah it's a good analogy well Stefan I thank you so much for coming on today and I hope your projects go very well for you well thank you very much Tommy I really appreciate it I really appreciate this chance to, to talk it's been oh, nice my pleasure nice to let me know when you're gonna air this and stuff Oh, yeah, I'm going to upload it in just a little bit. Terrific. Well, sir, thank you so much, and you have yourself a great rest of your day. Well, thank you, sir, and you as well. I will. And we'll be talking soon. Yes. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Stefan Arngrim. Ain't he a cool dude? Thank you so much, Stefan. I mean, you're a jack-of-all-trades in the industry and you've got so much on your plate and after all these years you're still working and still active and you continue you will continue to do so and you're a very nice man i thank you for coming on today um if you like this video everyone please subscribe to my youtube channel add me as a friend on facebook join my tommy kovac comedian page on facebook follow me on twitter and instagram and all that fun stuff well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Layer, dudes. <laughs>